Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child using the method of catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. Welcome back to the podcast, friends. I would like to share with you an episode that we did last year, right before Thanksgiving, where we explored the child's prayer. In the book, Listening to God with Children by Gianna Gobi, she states, the child's prayer can be very brief, such as Jesus, goodness, light, amen, and is often followed by a long silence. Furthermore, the spontaneous prayer of the younger child is exclusively a prayer of praise and thanksgiving. So as tomorrow, we here in America will celebrate the beautiful holiday of Thanksgiving, where we remember all the things that we are grateful for. May we also ponder the beautiful example that the children are in our life, who so naturally are always thankful. I hope you enjoy. Welcome, Diane, back to the podcast. I'm so happy that you're here with us again. Well, thank you, Carrie. I'm really glad to be asked to be back. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. You just have so much wisdom. We just want to hear it all. (laughs) Well, hopefully between the two of us, we can uh, help others (laughs) think about the young child a little more carefully. They have so much to teach us. (laughs) I know. I know. Well, today, Diane and I are going to be diving into... um, the chapter 14 of Listening to God with Children, which I think is kind of funny that you and I are doing this one because in our last episode together, it was like episode three, I think, um, you and I did the first two chapters of this book. And so we're just booking, <laughs> book ending it because now nice. we're on the last chapter of this book. Nice. I like that. I like that. <laughs> well, in this time of Thanksgiving, in this holiday season of Thanksgiving, the children have so much to teach us about how to pray. Um, Diane, in your experience, it, how, what does it look like to pray with children, especially at this time? Let's talk about the level one child, that three to six year old. What does that look like? Okay. Well, I think it, in the atrium, it can be um, very quiet and subtle and elusive. And mm-hmm. it's real easy as an adult in the room to kind of stomp on their prayer <laughs> yeah. or, or move too quickly out of a prayerful stance into something else when they're still praying. Yeah. Um, they're so subtle about it and so quiet and silent. And, and sometimes they don't even say any words at all, but they are praying. And so we really have to be observant and open and uh, attuned and very present when we're with them so that we can allow that prayer to come forth. It's so beautiful and such a great example. And I I think that's something that makes me keep wanting to come back to the atrium to be with the children is is the Mm -hmm. way the young child prays. It's Mm -hmm. just such a great example. It's it's peaceful. Yes. One thing in this chapter, when as I was rereading it, I I felt like us as adults, it's very easy for us to wait for the child to say a prayer like what we would say Mm -hmm. and like you said their prayer is different we forget I think that maybe they're just going to say a word Mm -hmm. or the silence right right Uh, I think you're absolutely right Carrie it and it's uh, it's a shame that we almost without thinking kind of superimpose our definition of prayer onto them and let's face it, children ages six and under are just so different than adults. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's just hard to relate to them, hard to even remember that sometimes. And uh, so that's the great thing, I think, about Montessori, opening our eyes to the developmental planes and, and realizing that this young child uh, is alive and developing and has not yet each reached the age of reason. Mm-hmm. So how is it that they live without that that ability to reason that we as adults just rely on every second of our lives, don't we? <laughs> mm-hmm. And then we start mm-hmm. working with these young young children and we realize, oh, wow, they're really transcendent and intuitive and relational and full of love and joy and wonder. And wow, that's, that's really different from the way I live my life. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so what a great invitation to dwell with them and to let them influence us and remind us of actually the way we used to be when we were young, right? And I yeah. think also it's something we have to look forward to, right? Because uh, 
it's the old person and, and the young child that are both mm -hmm. equally attuned to, to reality and in, in all its forms. And uh, so I, I'm looking forward to getting older for that reason that I might become more <laughs> like a young child. <laughs> <laughs> There's such beautiful examples to us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's Gianna in this chapter on page 118. She says that we cannot presume to teach prayer. Right. And that was profound for me. I It reminded me of something that Rebecca Wojtsevich said in one of her episodes with us about it's like we need to trust that the child already has the Holy Spirit inside of them. They received it at baptism. It's not something that we teach them it's already mm -hmm. there and mm -hmm. it's our job just to create the proper conditions for prayer um, mm -hmm. whether that be in our home or in the atrium or in the car or on a walk or while doing it uh, you know making bread or something whatever um, right right uh, and I think it's hardest to remember that when you are the parent of this young child especially if it's your first child because you I don't know about you, Carrie, but when I had my first child, I felt so responsible that I was mm -hmm. needing to make sure that this child grew up with every good thing in every good environment I could find. And and it, it didn't even occur to me that maybe the child was already in tune with God. You know, <laughs> but what do I need to, quote, teach this child about God? And yet the child will teach us so much about God if we just listen and watch and enjoy with them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, to Rebecca's point, there's a lot of richness and beauty within that child already. And we're just invited to enjoy it with them. And I think that's mm -hmm. one of the great things about the atrium, isn't it? Is we, we know we're not the teacher. We're mm -hmm. just there to get the environment ready, proclaim from the Bible or, or a, an aspect of liturgy, and then experience together what our responses will be. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's hard to trust that, I think, though. Uh, hard to trust that the child is... Uh, a very deep repository of this wisdom and joy and love. I think partly because they don't express it necessarily. Like you were saying, a lot of times they sit in silence with prayer or they might just say one word and you're not sure, you know, what, is there anything else you want to say? You know, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. the one word is enough, you know? So um, we have to get comfortable with the way they pray and trust that yes, they are in relationship with God and there is something going on there and it will reveal itself. Uh, in its perfect time. Yeah, I don't know about you, Diane, but I know for myself, I think as I've developed as a catechist at the beginning, I think I had more of a teacher mindset. Like mm -hmm. you want to teach them how to pray yeah. or you want to teach them the presentation of the Annunciation or whatever. Right, right. And especially lately, and I, I think actually the podcast has helped me grow in this way of being more observing and just receiving the children. And so this year in the atrium, I feel like I've opened my eyes a little bit more to what the children are trying to teach me. And it's made me aware of those little things that they do do that I think before I would have, like you said, thought that that was incomplete. Mm -hmm. um, but opening up your eyes a little bit to seeing those little things, like for example, a couple weeks ago, a, a cutest little boy in my level one atrium, we were sitting at the prayer table and I just read the scripture of uh, the people who walked in darkness will see a great light. Mm -hmm. And we were just sitting with that. And he said, God is my flashlight. Wow. That's beautiful. And that was it. That was it. That was his yeah. response. That was his prayer. That was his gift back to God for the scripture. Mm -hmm. It was so perfect and beautiful and it struck me right in the heart and uh -huh. I haven't let go of it since. Like, But uh -huh. I think that before I would have thought that that was, I don't know, maybe incomplete or um, not a prayerful response, not a reflection. Mm -hmm. um, so that I, I just am so grateful for this method that it's taught me that those, those little responses are full and complete forms of prayer. Right, right. Wow, that, that's profound. I think, you know, you could write an essay on that one sentence, that God is my flashlight. <laughs> I mean, if you think about, you know, where would God choose to send the light if you're holding that flashlight where, and it's God's light, you know, what are you mm -hmm. going to see? Where will it mm -hmm. guide you? And, you know, that's marvelous. Plus, mm -hmm. for all we know, he has his own favorite flashlight at home that means a lot to him. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. it, you know, it, it could be feeding something that's going on at home or a birthday got present he got or I mean, we just don't know. 
but to accept mm -hmm. that, like you said, and enjoy it and, and appreciate it is, is the key. Yeah. Whether you're a parent or a catechist, I think that's it, but, but it's hard to do. And a lot of times Carrie, too, those comments can come at the most inopportune times, especially for parents. You know, the, the child is resting, they want to do something, they want to take one more minute at the park, but you need to go because you know you have to go get groceries and then pick up your child from school. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and uh, it's, it's hard to let, make ourselves or give ourselves permission even to just stop our busyness in order to just dwell with what that young child is looking at or what they're enjoying or what they might encourage us or draw us to enjoy. And it really is probably a gift from God that the young child notices before us, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's funny, I was walking in the park this summer and uh, COVID being what it is, you know, there were people outside, but we were still social distancing. And there's a really tall man, and I'm a short person, there's a really tall man, turned the corner, and he had probably, I don't know, barely two-year-old with him. And the man uh, turned the corner, walked past me, didn't look me in the eye or anything. His child turns the corner, stops dead in his tracks, stops straight in front of me, looks up at me, looks right at my face. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, that's us in a nutshell, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we as adults go about our busy day and here's this child noticing, boom, there's another human being. I need to see what she's like. I need to look in her face. I mm. need to see her eyes. You know, it was just yeah. such a treasure. I don't think he said anything to me, but I was so struck by his whole manner. And I just smiled back at him. It was like we knew that we were noticing each other, even if his dad was going on his merry way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Living in the gift. moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It was a great gift. And we as adults, we do such a good job of, come on, come on, come on, I trying know. to get them to always go at our pace. And yeah. Um, yet, yet they're the ones in a more healthy pace in life. Mm. Right. It's hard. It's a hard uh, balance to keep. And, you know, sometimes we just need to get going because there are things that need to, to get done. But, you know, maybe trying to balance those choices a little more evenly. You know, last time I rushed him, but today we're going to take five extra minutes, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, letting God bless you in that way. Yeah. I think it takes us working on our own inner peace as well in order for us to create exterior peace with our children in our lives. Yeah. That's a real good point. Yeah. I, it kind of reminds me of the great law. You have to love your neighbor as yourself, right? So mm -hmm. yeah. give, give yourself that permission and then allow others around you to have that permission too. Yeah. Well, in Gianna says that, so we can't presume to teach prayer. It is our job to create the condition for silence and reverence, which will help the child to focus on and listen to God. So Diane, how can we do that? As adults with children in our lives, how can we create conditions in an environment for silence and reverence and prayer? Yeah, I think maybe I, I would back up just a second and just say, what is prayer? Because I think mm. as adults, a lot of times we think, oh, prayer is the Our Father and the Hail Mary and the Glory Be. And, you know, we have our list of uh, prayers that the church uses, which are mm -hmm. beautiful, and a mm -hmm. lot of them have uh, biblical sources. So, of course, we want to repeat those words and make them a part of our lives. But if we can think of prayer as the way Gobi speaks of it, it's an, an initiation into the mystery of God, she says. And so prayer itself is a mystery, right? It, it's a means mm -hmm. of knowing God, she says. But it demands of us not only speaking but listening. Mm-hmm. And I remember talking to a catechist once, and she said, God's language is silence. My language is English. <laughs> and I thought that was such a great way to put it, right? Yeah. yeah. So if I'm going to speak something to God in my native tongue, how am I going to hear that response? I would need to sit in silence. And, and that's not the only way God communicates with us. But I think for our prayer lives, whether they're individual or with young children, uh, let's keep that in mind. That God's language is silence. And, um, you know, uh, Gobi has that wonderful game called the silence game. Where mm -hmm. we just, yes. you know, let's, let's make silence for 10 seconds together, see if we can do that. And it's a game. It's not a disciplinary measure, right? So <laughs> right, we're just going right. to try it for fun. And, you know, if, if we can do it for 10 seconds, then we notice what we've heard while we were silent. And then we want to Maybe next time I'm going to make a noise during the silent time. And then you tell me what that noise is. And then she goes even further to say, well, now let's listen within ourselves. And what will we hear in this silence? 
And we've done that in the atrium before. We've done, you can do that at home too with with your own kids uh, or in the car or whenever you're together, really. And afterward, once the kids are practiced in this game, they'll say things like, I heard Jesus tell me he loves me. Or hmm. I heard the good shepherd call my name. Hmm. Or I heard the voice of God. And it's such a great... Um, way of appreciating silence but also getting better at creating it or making silence and i think mm -hmm. especially in our world in our in our culture today there's noise all around uh, and even when we think things are quiet there's the hum of the air conditioner or there's the horn of the distant train or <laughs> the highway yeah. noise far away you know there's always something aren't you struck carrie when you really do get out in the wilderness how very silent it is Mm -hmm. So that invitation to keep going quieter, 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 I think is, is a great thing. Um, how have you fostered that with your kids in the atrium or in your family? I think it's like trying to get comfortable, especially with silence. Um, uh -huh. I, like you said, there's so much noise all around us. It's almost uncomfortable when mm -hmm. we're silent. Mm -hmm. And um, I always try to think about how like in the atrium, it's okay for the children to wander. It's okay for them to, to be bored. It's okay for them to not know what to do. And so in our family, when my kids are bored or they don't, they come to me and they say, what should I do? I don't know what to do. I, I just let them be bored. And I tell them, oh, just be bored then, you know. And I think that um, like the silent game, it kind of helps you be comfortable with not doing, which yeah. especially in our culture is not normal and people I think are very uncomfortable with it, especially when you have once you have a phone you know like as soon as you're not doing something you grab your phone <laughs> right. right so like yeah. this idea of just being is such a foundation for prayer especially listening prayer where you're actually mm -hmm. not just talking you're listening um you have to get used to just being yes and so allowing our children to just be whether it's in the atrium or at home and yes. not be stimulated constantly. Yes. Um, I think it's a beautiful way to prepare them for a life of um, listening. Uh huh. I remember reading recently, I think, uh, I can't remember the source, but they said, I remember reading, boredom is the beginning of creativity. Yeah. It's part of creativity. So yeah. I, I, I hold on to that and I think, great, you're bored, great. You know, yeah. you're, gonna, you're about to create something. You know, it might be a fight with your brother or it might be a beautiful piece yeah. of art. I don't know, but you know, there's something it's to something. do it. Yeah, yeah, right. Let's see what life brings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Another thing that Gianna talks about is um, language, especially that level one child that in that first plane where they are such a sensitive period for language, but like gifting the children with the language and you know, we, we read the beautiful scriptures with them in order for them to be exposed to that language, that beautiful language of God. And there's so many beautiful Psalms and just simple little Psalms that we can gift them with so that they have this beautiful language imprinted on their heart so that they can use in prayer or in their silence, or maybe when they're older, those words are imprinted on their heart and very easy to access. Mm -hmm. But the beautiful gift of language but simple language, you know, I think it goes back to the, they, they pray simply. And mm -hmm. so not to make the language complex either, just, um, right. I'm trying to see if I can find, oh yeah, here. So like from Psalm 84, 11, the Lord is a sun and shield. Mm -hmm. It's a very short and simple language that we can give them mm -hmm. to power their prayer. Right. And, and even before that, she says, uh, it could be one word like mm -hmm. light yeah. or amen or alleluia and that the, the youngest child will pray prayers of praise and thanksgiving and and that's it mm -hmm. and how again how unusual is that for us as adults because we think oh i have to pray for this or i have to lift her up in prayer or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know I, I need to ask god about this or that or or uh, ask him for his mercy to help me do better next time for x whereas the kids are praising and thanking god and that's it. And mm -hmm. um, I've gotten, as I get older, I wake up earlier and earlier in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but I find that those quiet times in the early morning are such good times for prayer. And often I will challenge myself to only pray prayers of praise and thanksgiving. 
Hmm. And I'll tell you, I have to think a while before I can start to do that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but also the uh, being in the atrium has helped me so much with that as well. Because I can yeah. use the examples of Simeon in the temple or Mary's Magnificat, you know, those wonderful stories we read in the infancy narratives or the beautiful words um, of the names of Jesus you mentioned in the prophecies, right? The people mm-hmm. who walk in darkness have seen a great light. And so can I just praise God and can I just thank God? And, and how long can I do that? Can I do that mm. a, a simple prayer for every bead of the rosary instead of a Hail Mary? Can, can I pray 50 prayers of praise and thanksgiving to God? It's I kind like of a fun that. challenge. So, yeah. yeah. And it, I think it helps me um, appreciate that young child more, too. Have you ever read the book 1,000 Gifts? I've heard of it, but I don't think I've read it. It's really good. So the author, she talks about how she was challenged to write down a, a thousand gifts to be thankful to God for. And it's her progression of how, you know, you start with the big things. Like, I'm thankful for my husband. I'm thankful for my kids. I'm thankful for my life. Um, but how it gets more challenging the farther into it you go. Uh-huh. And she starts starts to find gifts in the small things. Like, I'm, I'm thankful for the way that the sun is reflecting on the water and creating this beautiful gleam. Wonderful. And then also goes into the the trials in life. And how you're thankful for these trials that happen in life because of yes. where God has allowed them to take you or the the growth right. that has come from them, even though that they were really hard to go through. And um, it's a really beautiful practice, like what you're talking about. Like, yeah, as, say as many prayers of thanksgiving or praise as there are beads on the rosary. And I think it like rewires our brain when mm-hmm. we try to open up our eyes to the things that our gifts to us and Mm -hmm. um, that we can be thankful for Mm -hmm. and to not take them for granted as well. And the children are such beautiful examples to us of like, I mean, I just this week, the little girl, uh, a little girl in my atrium and our, in our closing prayer, she was saying, I thank you for my mom. I thank you for my dad. I'm thank you for my dog. I'm the, and like, she, you know, we've all had this as she went on for five minutes of all the things she was thankful for. <laughs> and it, she easily very ra- could rattle it all off so easily because she's very deeply in her heart thankful for each of these things. Wow. wow. And, and she experiences them all as gifts. So it's immediately easy for her to rattle all of them off. Oh, what and, a great example. Yeah. Right. Like she could hit those beads of the rosary easy, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> She could do all 15. <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah. That reminds me in, in our uh, level one atrium, we, every week we, we have to sing the song, thank you, Lord, for giving us. And then you fill in the blank, right? Yeah. Thank, thank you, Lord, for giving us light. Thank you, Lord, for giving us light right where we are. And then every child takes a turn. What are we going to thank God for? Well, I've had this little girl, this is the second year I've had her in, in level two. And last year, she was noticeably younger than she is now. She's matured a lot, but she loved unicorns. And so when it came time for her to offer what she was thankful for, she wanted to be thankful for unicorns. Mm-hmm. And there I'm sitting as a CGS catechist with Sophia's <laughs> words in my mind, thinking the children need to be oriented to reality. They need to be oriented to reality. And I'm thinking unicorns are not real. What do I do? You know. And so I, uh, she said unicorns and I said to her, let's choose something we can see when we look outside. And so she thought about it. And then I don't remember what she picked, flower or grass or something. And then we went on singing and then the next child had a turn. And so that happened a few times during the atrium year. So then she comes back this year and and she's noticeably more mature. And we are still at the end at the prayer table singing this song. Thank you, Lord, for giving us that. And another child offers... um, when it's, when it's that child's turn, they say, uh, I want to thank God for pizza. <laughs> and so thank you, Lord, for giving us pizza. Da, da, da. And pretty soon, my little friend has sidled up to my shoulder and she's got her hand on it. And so I put my hand on her and I look up and she says, God didn't make pizza. People made pizza. <laughs> and I thought, she's right. <laughs> now what do we do? <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we had to take pizza apart and we had to thank God for milk from a cow and tomatoes on the vine and wheat in the field that humans take and change into what we use to make pizza. Mm-hmm. So clearly she's on the verge of level the, the second plane of development, right? Because she's getting right, more right. analytical in her thought. 
But I thought how interesting that was and what a change in her. All of a sudden, boom, she's thinking, wait a minute, this isn't what I thought it was supposed to be. And I need to make sure that I know that, that, that she knows this and, and let's mm-hmm. fix this song, you know? <laughs> yeah. I thought it was fabulous. Uh, yeah. It's such a great thing. That reminds me so much of the the history of the gifts work that we do there in level two and three and how we dissect all the gifts that God has given us. And that work has made me be more thankful for all the little gifts that God, you know, the metals that God has put into the earth for us to discover yes. thousands of years later. And um, that work definitely fosters a heart of thanksgiving. Yes. And we have Montessori to thank for that with cosmic education, don't we? Mm-hmm. She says the, the kids are like spiders on this giant web and they want to know everything once they reach the age of six. So that work stemmed from uh, from Montessori's observations. I, I think it's great. I wanted to tell you one more thing because I think it. I think you will laugh at this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I was noticing um, a few months ago that I was being particularly ungrateful, and so I thought, what what practice do I need in my life to make myself get more on the on the straight and narrow here? So I decided <laughs> that every day when I sat down to my breakfast, I was going to thank God for every element of my breakfast. Hey. So I'm sitting sitting at the table, and I've got my toast with the almond butter on it and blueberries on top. And I'm thinking, thank you, Lord, for blueberry farmers and for peanut growers and wheat growers and grain growers and millers and manufacturers and grocery store clerks. And, you know, and then I started realizing and electricity and clean water and, heat <laughs> and you know, boom, 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 boom. And, and then so pretty soon I became more like a three to six year old, right? Yeah, <laughs> I could figure out all those things that I was just very easily taking for granted as I was scarfing down my breakfast on my way to work, you know? Um, Yeah, I love that. I think parents and and kids could do that um, at any meal. Mm -hmm. And even, even while you're eating, you know, yeah. um, What, what are we, what are we enjoying here that we did not create? Mm -hmm. We need to thank for that. You know, Montessori had this great uh, anecdote where she said, it's so easy for people when they go on a hike say, in a nature um, preserve or up a mountain, you know, out in the wilderness, and and you look around at the beauty that surrounds you, and you just, it's so easy to thank God and to praise God for his creation. She said, why is it that we don't have that same attitude when we walk down a city street and be grateful to the humans that came before us that discovered and then created everything that we are currently enjoying as we walk Mm -hmm. down this city street? Mm -hmm. I thought, wow. Wow. To, to your point of, you know, the history of the gifts, as we get older and start to really appreciate that great span of, hi- of history and the mm-hmm. great span of the work of humankind. And then here we come in this certain moment in history. So what are, what are we grateful for? Not only from God, but from one another. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, I think you'll hit your 50 beads really fast. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. What a way to be thankful right now with this beautiful season uh-huh. of Thanksgiving. Like I think that... Yeah. Uh, those are beautiful examples. Well, Diane, before we finish, I wanted to ask you if you could speak into what about the level two, level three child, that second plane child, how is their prayer different? And is there any different way that we can foster their prayer? Yeah, that that's an interesting change because they move into what Montessori called the second plane of development. And that's when the moral life awakens. So all of a sudden, when they move into that plane and we don't know when it, when it will be, you just notice a change in their behavior, but they realize they're one of many people in the world and they're part of a community. And along with that realization is how do I behave? How do I relate to these people? How do I want them to relate to me? Mm -hmm. And how do we as people um, unite as the people of God in order to build the kingdom and, and give, glory to the father. So it's really beautiful to see that unfold within the children. And you'll see more children working in groups. And along with that comes (laughs) a lot of challenges and struggles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I got a a great email from a catechist that I had had in level two formation over a, a summer intensive. And she emailed me that fall. And she said, I just wanted to share what happened in our level two atrium last week, there were a group of children that were um, ready to plan our prayer time together. So what we would call a, um, a bridged communal prayer. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. she said. So I told them the elements they could use. They can choose any ones they want, you know, scripture, music, silence, um, formal prayer, intercessory prayer, etc. And then she let the group go ahead and do their work. And she said it was a disaster. She said they were <laughs> arguing. Um, they weren't listening to each other. And there were moments as they were, quote, working, that she felt really tempted to step in and try to bring some peace to the group. But she realized, nope, I need to step back. You know, Montessori says the process is the goal, right? So we're going to let them have this experience. So she said it took them 30 minutes to plan this prayer. And they finally were done. And then she said when they were done, one of them went to a couple other and apologized because they realized they weren't listening well. And then another child had to apologize to someone else because they realized that they were being a little too willful and they weren't being fair in the way they had treated that child. And she said, eventually it all worked itself out, but uh, she had noticed that even during their conversation, during that 30 minutes of hectic craziness, she said, she heard one of the kids say, whenever people try to work together, it's a disaster. <laughs> But afterwards, she said her catechist assistant came up to her and said, this is so great that you let the kids do this. I am so glad they had a chance to do this. So really what's happening, we're just trying to figure out how to live with each other. And it's messy and mm -hmm. it can be ugly. And, and we really need that ability to forgive as well as the ability to, to love uh, one another. So I actually have an example I could read you, but we have this book of yeah. um, prayers for um, our catechists, whenever something happens in the atrium, we ask them, write it down in this book. So we have some Ooh, anecdotes. I, like I was looking at these before we talked. So this was from uh, a level three atrium. And they're in that atrium. This was during Lent. And two of the kids in that atrium were, were also twins in the same family, a brother and a sister. Mm -hmm. And the catechist writes that during this atrium session, they had been experiencing she writes, great aggravation being an atrium together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get that. Okay. You get that. Yeah. 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 And she said, so she continues to write, it became so intense one evening that the sister had to walk out to try to regain composure. So she <laughs> left the atrium for a little while to, to get, a, get a grip on things. And then she writes, during work, she planned the communal prayer. And she chose the prayer card that read, Remove the wooden beam from your eye first. <laughs> then you will see clearly to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. <laughs> and then she writes, after we all read that prayer card out loud at the end of our prayer time, one boy in the group, his jaw just dropped. And then he began to applaud. And then everybody else joined in the applause. And the last sentence she writes is, the sister was filled with joy after her work and the prayer. That older plain child's prayer looks so different. Yes, yes. They're in the thick of it. They are in the thick of it. And I think they get so many great inspirations and lessons from things like the maxims and other parables that we study together or, or mm -hmm. ponder together in the atrium. And they always stick with them, you know, that they, they remember them. And they influence them. Um, I mean, how many times when you've done the reconciliation meditations, what are the kids praying for? It's usually a sibling or somebody on the playground that bugs them every time they go out to play. Hmm. Those, those conflicts are real to them and they want to know, what do we do? Mm -hmm. do, we do? And so, yeah. you know, if they can go back to scripture and be re renewed and, and refreshed and, and inspired to go out again, try again next time, try again next week. You know, let, let's keep trying. Remember that anecdote where a catechist said to the children, um, these maxims are hard. Maybe we should just get rid of them. <laughs> and the children responded in shock. And they said, no, no, we have to try. We have to try. Mm. And isn't that it? You know, in the trying, yeah. in, in, the, in the attempt at loving and the effort at forgiving and going back again the next week. And uh, that that's what gives glory to God. Isn't and it? that's prayer. Until we get to parousia, that's the best we can do. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Our prayer to, to keep at it and not give up. Yeah, that's right. When our trying is an offering, yes. when the work of those children for 30 minutes working on their communal prayer was, was an offering. It, those yes. are all forms of prayer. That's right. Yes. And it's great to acknowledge that uh, and to encourage them. You know, 
oh, it's so great that you you did this prayer time together. I know it wasn't easy, but look what you did. You know, um, we're supposed to be their cheerleaders and as they go about that effort of, of working together. So. I love that. We're their cheerleaders. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Life is hard. It is hard. <laughs> but God's given us all we need. So <laughs> is there anything else that you would like to share with us before we finish today? I think the only other thing I was thinking of was uh, that beautiful verse, the first verse of Psalm 23, and the mm-hmm. way that in the atrium we often use the translation from the Good News Bible. So it would read, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. Mm-hmm. It doesn't say, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I want. And I think sometimes in our prayer, you know, we, we ask for something, we don't get it. We ask for something, we don't get it. And we might wonder, well, what's going on? Is God not hearing me? Doesn't God hear my request? And, and what is God saying to us? You know, I know what you need, and I will give it to you when it's the best time for you to have it. Mm-hmm. And so I think we're, our invitation there is just to move forward in faith and trust that you know, I may really think I need something right now, and I'm not getting it. But, but God knows what I need, and God will see that I get what I need. Mm-hmm. And I can keep asking, right? Like the insistent friend, I can keep asking. But, but I think even deeper than that, with our trust in God, that, that we have everything we need right now and that we will always have everything we need. That, that's such a great, great relief, isn't it? And, and yeah. a great gift. And the kids seem to trust that so easily. They yeah. seem to already be like, yep, you've given me what I need. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. they know who God is. They know that God loves them. And loves them completely. And so they know they can trust him to give them what he needs. Well, I hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, you too. Thank you for sharing everything with us. I really appreciate you coming on the show again and talking with me. It's always so much fun. It is so much fun. The time just flies. So thank you for having me. (laughs) Thank you, Diane. God bless you. You too. God bless you, Carrie. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. Next episode, in two weeks, we will continue our Montessori series with a dive into practical life with Sherry Mock. I hope you enjoyed re-exploring the gift of Thanksgiving with Diana Olson. If you would like to read more about the child's prayer, I strongly encourage you to pick up your copy of Listening to God with Children. The very last chapter, chapter 14, is titled Helping the Child Pray. And it goes beautifully with what Diane was speaking about in this episode. If you know anybody who might benefit from this podcast, I ask that you please help us to spread the word, to share this podcast with them so that we can share this beautiful gift that the children have given us through Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. We would like to thank all the contributing members for making this podcast possible. If you would like to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, or if you would like to become a member, please go to CGS usa.org. Thank you all for listening this week. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.